uh, giving some context to the region, to what's gone on in the region for 75 years. The Israelis calling for his head. Thousands have died in Gaza, obviously. 2,300 children, if you believe, the health authority in Gaza, which some say is controlled by Hamas. It's terrible. It's a bloodbath. What happened in Israel, terrible too. But my next guest, well, my guest this hour, terrific former BBC journalist, excellent broadcaster, not the BCFM politics show in Bristol. He believes there's something much bigger going on, and he's here to tell us about that. Good evening and welcome back, Tony Gosling. Hi, Richie. Well, I've just been thinking about... Um, he's, I'm friends with him on Facebook. Uh, he's a guy called Tim Thwellin. I never knew him at the BBC, but during the first Gulf War, I remember that he and several other journalists were based out in the Middle East. Actually, I think it was in Beirut at offices which were armour plated called Memo. Uh, I think it was stood for Middle East uh, Media Operation or something like that. And uh, what we were getting uh, back in 1990s is going back a while was loads of historical context. Now, you know, the, the BBC have done, had a little bit of an attempt to do that. In fact, I was listening listening to them last night and they had somebody who was just talking about up to the Second World War, which was rather pointless, it seemed to me, because most of the interesting stuff happened during the Second World War in the creation of the State of Israel. And of course, he would never go into the involvement of people like Nelson Rockefeller and Victor Rothschild in creating that State of Israel, which I can talk about if you want. But, um, you know, the, the, these contextual pieces are what journalism is really all about. And we're seeing almost nothing at the moment. We're seeing uh, bun fights and squabbles uh, with accusations being made at the UN, the UN Secretary General being forced to respond to the Israelis, uh, calling for his resignation. Um, and, you know, so it, we're not really getting any, I think, very, very little. I'm seeing very, very little proper journalism about the analysis, the deep analysis of what's going on and what the agendas might be. A lot of people saying, oh, well, this is just the Israelis going crazy. They do this from time to time. It's mad there. But no, I, so I don't agree with that. I think there's a much you know, wider agenda behind a lot of this. And there are reasons why the Israelis don't care about what the world thinks. Uh, they're actually uh, uh, they're on a kind of um, uh, road to sort of pr they, they want to provoke. And it, this is more about the response that it that you get they're getting around the world they're getting their desired response which is fueling hatred and actually it's a massive recruiting tool for hamas and and i think they understand that at the, the deepest level meaning what tony meaning that what happened in in southern israel on the 7th of october that israel has taken that and is running with it now is responding in the way that it is responding because it wants to create this fury of hatred and bitterness around the world, uh, division. Some say they want to drag Iran into some sort of conflict. They want to get Hezbollah involved. What about those who say that this is Israel's final push to take Gaza um, and to take what is left of Palestine once and for all? Do you have any sympathy with that point of view? Well, I, I, I mean, yes, it is. You know, I, th I think there's more to it j than just this land grab. I mean, what about Northern Ireland? We were doing exactly the same in Northern Ireland. The British intelligence services were aiding uh, the UVF and the UFF uh, in in targeting, in, in a lot of the targeting of, and sectarian killings. We now know this. This has slowly been coming out uh, over the last few decades. Uh, and this, you, you have to look at this and say, well, hang on, if the uh, British state through MI5 is doing this kind of activity, what is the point of it? Because you're just making the conflict worse. And I, and I think that, that that's what's going on, I think, over in Israel. It's more about just taking the land in Gaza. Obviously, the, the Israelis are quite aware that if they send their ground troops into Gaza, then they may, they may kick off a much wider war. Uh, and it might be simply this, Richie, that every few years they do this thing they call mowing the lawn, which is just to reduce the population of Gaza. It's a sort of blood sacrifice, really, because they know, and the West Bank, obviously, because they know uh, that the demographics, if they if they leave the Palestinians alone, uh, because of their horrendous conditions, um, at largely, and their beliefs of various sorts, that they're it's a bit like Northern Ireland with the Catholics, that they will have more kids and uh, they will start overtaking uh, the Zionists or the Jewish population. And so they, th this is a very brutal way of looking at it. But uh, I think that's what they want to do. They just want to reduce the population. They want to scare everybody into thinking that they're going to go too far. 
Uh, but I don't think they really want to have a war with Lebanon and Syria. Um, well, well, I mean, you know, I may be wrong. They may decide this is the time to create a war which actually threatens the existence of Israel, and therefore the Americans would come running to their rescue. Uh, so, I mean, that, that certainly that's the way I see it, and I'm trying to pick up on, you know, trying yeah. to now to do some of the analysis that was so useful for me when I was working at the BBC back in the 1990s and covering the first Gulf War and trying to understand what is the geopolitics and almost the sort of spiritual politics of the area, because it's quite obvious to me. The Israelis are embarked on a plan to try and create a religious war. It's based around the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They want to demolish that mosque and therefore actually kick off uh, a war between this fake version of Judaism that they call Zionism or certainly the Likud party and um, and uh, with the Islamic states and Muslim states that are surrounding them. This is exactly what people were worried about, uh, the creation of the state of Israel in 1948. Uh, they were saying, well, you know, and even in the Balfour Declaration, they said that this must come, not come at the expense of the local population. Well, of course, once they got their state and their army, uh, that was all just forgotten about, and uh, and they've been uh, killing uh, Palestinians and stealing their land ever since. What about some Jewish people listening to this might say, your characterization of it as mowings alone, and you said it's a blood sacrifice. Jews listening to this might say, Tony Gosling, that's a blood libel. Um, they're defending themselves, they might say. Whatever about the historical context, and I obviously will see eye to eye with you on much of that, the fact is Jewish people will say, they went into southern Israel, they did some unspeakable things there. What did they expect would happen? Israel was bound to retaliate. And it's, well, it's wrong yeah. to, to criticise uh, that. Yeah, well, look, uh, this is far more than that, isn't it, though? The, 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 the number of um, innocent um, civilians, Palestinian civilians that are being killed, is far, far more. It's, you know, the result of it is going to be recruitment to Hamas. People are going to be... I mean, this is what I was sort of referencing Northern yeah. Ireland, really is that the result of the British uh, uh, atrocities um, working along with the, uh, with the um, loyalist terrorist groups was an enormous recruitment tool for the IRA. So when people saw these things going on, understandably, they said, well, we need to fight back. We can't allow this to carry on. And so this is exactly what's going on right around the Arab world, and particularly, of course, in uh, West Bank and Gaza is it's turning people who uh, for, for maybe decades have been moderates and who are saying, well, actually, look, we need to just do deals with the Israelis. We need to get along with them. Uh, they're now thinking to themselves, well, the Israelis won't. We, it, there's no point. And in, 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 and so we need to pick up arms. And this is the result of the policies that Israel is going. Up. When you talk about blood libel, I mean, I don't quite understand what that means. I mean, what we're seeing is we're seeing that there's the shedding of thousands of lives of uh, many of them children and women of innocent blood by the Israeli Air Force. We're not talking about, you know, confronting them face to face. We're talking about flying over the top with drones and with mostly U.S. jets and just dropping bombs on people and killing them. Uh, and so this whole idea of trying to exterminate Hamas obviously is not working. What's happening is loads of civilians are being killed instead. Uh, and and the, the 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 end result of it is totally counterproductive. Tony, it's this a, guy, a massive re recruiting tool for Hamas. This guy Lerner, uh, forgive me for not remembering his his first name. This guy Lerner, who's from Harrow, who is a spokesperson for the IDF. He's originally from Harrow in London. Uh, he's doing the press pretty much for. Uh, the IDF, he maintains and has maintained every day, as has former Israeli officials like Mark Regev and others, the IDF is doing all it can to get rid of Hamas and is not deliberately targeting civilians in Gaza. And they say, whether we like to it, whether we like it or not, they say, guys like you and me, because I disagree with them, but they say, whether we like it or not, we can eat our hats because they're there. Hamas deliberately hides not only does it hide its foot soldiers, but it hides its weapons in places that are heavily populated by civilians. What else can we do, say the Israelis? What do you say to that? Well, he's lying. He's not targeting Hamas. He's targeting civilians. Uh, and, he, you know, they're making out, trying to make some sort of case. I mean, actually, the Israelis lie quite a lot. 
uh, they li- they lied also about whether they got a warning that this attack was happen- going to happen uh, by the Egyptians. That was revealed by a U.S. senator a couple of days after the attack on the 7th of October. So I think what we're seeing is just... And you know, they also, of course, lied about whether or not they blew up the um, Baptist Al-Ali Hospital last week, killing 500 people i would say almost all innocent people sheltering in a hospital uh, or having been brought to a hospital to uh, have their wounds tended to uh, and i thought it was very interesting the timing of that just as sunak and biden were flying out there and when they arrived uh, they were it's almost as if they were being dared to stand on the tv screens patting netanyahu on the back for committing that war crime and then they lied about whether they'd done it or not even though uh, their official spokespeople actually admitted the uh, attack had been uh, carried out by the Israelis. They then turned around and uh, then they said, oh, no, it wasn't us. It was Hamas and a misfired rocket from Hamas. So they're lying about that, too. I mean, the, the, the Hamas doesn't have anything that would uh, be such a powerful weapon as to do that. And then, of course, they lie again with making up. They actually did even went to the trouble of recording a fake transcript of uh, so-called uh, Islamic Jihad fighters. Saying, yeah, but how do you know it's fake? How do you know it's fake, Chief? proved to be a fake. But by who? And who proved it was a fake? They're liars, Richie. Yeah, and look, I'm, I'm not saying they're not. Hang on, hang on. I'm not saying they're not. But look, yeah, I know, by the way, I'm, I'm not going to contradict what you said about Israel, about the IDF initially um, admitting that it was involved in the hospital bombing. Because in the moments afterwards, there were tweets that went out saying, that they were operating in that area. So you're right to say that, right? But I'm still not convinced either way, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But on this um, this transcript at this crazy press conference put together by the IDF where they said we have the proof only 12 hours after the uh, the bomb, why I haven't seen any proof that the transcript of the two jihadis having a conversation is fake. Why do you believe that to be fake? Well, it's uh, it was... Um analysed over in London, uh, Channel 4 News, and they announced uh, the next evening, they said, oh, well, we've had analysts look at this, and the the accents are wrong, the idioms are wrong, uh, the uh, the language that's used is wrong for uh, the people that they're saying are doing it. So we, we are announcing that we think this is just has just been faked up, mocked up. That was on Channel 4 News. I didn't now, see you that. Know, it, 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 that, was, and that was a British analysis of that tape. Uh, from London, uh, it wasn't, you know, some, from somewhere else, and and I think, you know, there there, there is also the fact that uh, it was tweeted, and I've got the guy's name. If you if you give me a minute, I can find it. But he tweeted that we have just attacked the hospital, yeah. and then he deleted the tweet. You know, he's the official spokesperson for the IDF, and uh, so I'm afraid the evidence is 100. percent This is just, and it was, and I think the purpose of it was, uh, I mean, it's very perverse, but the idea is to to tell a big lie. Uh, and then to force Sunak and Biden to stand there on TV saying, uh, we we still support the Israelis. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's a psychological... What, it's basically the way the mafia do things. What they want to do is they want to bring uh, other people in on their crimes. And so they become implicated too. And, of course, Crispin Blunt, MP, uh, the Tory, announced last weekend very uh, I think wisely that anybody that it supports verbally uh, it from the British government or materially what the Israelis are up to is also guilty of war crimes. Can I just mention an, an honourable and a noble mention for Crispin Blunt? Please correct me if I get the committee wrong. But didn't he head up the Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee, didn't he? And didn't I they? Was, yeah, I think he was chair. He was chair a while ago. And yeah. do you know what they did? They produced a report about seven or eight years ago, a report that said that David Cameron lied through his teeth about the situation in Libya, and so did Barack Obama. This report is in the public domain, and that there should have been no fly zone there, or, or there should not have been a no fly zone. This was brilliant. Within weeks, he was gone, and an yeah. arch criminal, an arch thug, Tom Tugendhat, replaced him. I'll never forget that. Well, a, a Bilderberger as well. A yeah. Bilderberger well, I mean, replacing, the interesting yeah. thing about all this is the total uh, absence of the Labour Party saying absolutely nothing. So it's taking now the Conservatives to be the only critics of the Conservative government, uh, especially on their foreign foreign policy. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, we need to try always try to take a step back from these conflicts. Because obviously, as the UN Secretary-General said, and a lot of people 
spend a lot of their time criticizing the UN. And I do too on occasions, you know, particularly over the UN organizations, which have got no money coming in from the member states, but they're getting private funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and often from China. Uh, so they've become owned. These, you know, like, I'm talking about things like the World Health Organization. Uh, but at the UN Security Council, I think, he, you know, Guterres did an excellent job yesterday in uh, I mean, and he was being criticized. I couldn't believe it. I just listening just now on the BBC. Uh, by the former uh, former um, British ambassador to the UN, uh, Mark Lyle Graham, I think his name is, uh, saying that he, he oh he, the most controversial thing he said was calling for a ceasefire. This is this would benefit Hamas. How dare he do that? This is very biased for the UN Secretary General to call for a ceasefire. Well, how is it going to benefit Hamas? Of course, at the moment uh, we're, they're in a, a siege situation. And a ceasefire is the obvious. I mean, even a maybe a four or five year old child could see the obvious thing to do is to just stop killing people. Uh, at the moment, it's only really Israelis killing Palestinians um, in retribution uh, for what happened on the 7th. Um, and by the way, a lot of those hostages, uh, uh, it quotes many of those hostages were actually killed by the IDF, who decided that they rather than uh, negotiate, that they would just kill all the, the um, captors, the fighters, the uh, the Hamas fighters, and many of the hostages at the same time. Well, where's the proof of this, Tony? I, I haven't seen any proof of that. Well, it's the there's a, a fascinating, well, I think very good uh, video of, from Israeli radio with a lady who was caught in, a th I can't remember the name of the... Um, uh, of the kibbutz but uh, she she was saying i'm sure i'm sure your uh, listeners know exactly what i'm talking about many of them would have seen this uh, where it was a uh, there were many people in the kibbutz who had been taken hostage and and when the idf turned up on the scene they just started shooting into the kibbutz and that she was one of only two people that survived the entire thing uh, so she was she and one other woman survived all the rest of the hostages were killed uh, and she says in this interview, she said many of them were killed by the IDF in the crossfire. So it wasn't just the uh, the um, Hamas people just pointing their guns at the hostages and shooting them dead. Uh, it, you know, there were loads of bullets coming in and killing uh, the hostages. So this is not it's not fair to say that all the people who were killed, as we're getting in the media uh, on the 7th, were killed by Hamas. They weren't. And of course, the reason Hamas did this is as an attempt to try and force the Israelis to negotiate. And the Israelis have got this thing called the Hannibal policy, which means they don't want to negotiate. So the poor old hostages are just going to have to be collateral damage. Now, that's one of the reasons why we've seen all these demonstrations in Tel Aviv outside the Defence Ministry, many of which are by the family members of the um, of the people who were taken hostage and have now many of them, have, of course, have been killed by the airstrikes over in Gaza and many were killed by the IDF on the day itself. Let me ask you another question about this, which... which um might make sense in terms of the gains for the current Israeli administration. Before I do that, you're listening to Tony Gosling. The time is exactly 16 and a half minutes to the top of the hour. Uh, Tony is behind the, not the BCFM politics show, Bristol, Fridays at 5 o'clock. Go to thisweek.org.uk. Check out Bilderberg.org. Former BBC journalist, uh, great guy, been speaking on our shows for years and years. Thank heavens for that. I, I, from what I understand, the the judicial reforms that have gotten Israeli men and women up in arms for months now are can be explained reasonably simply. The Supreme Court in Israel is left-leaning, and it wants oversight over what the Israeli government does in terms of crimes against humanity in Palestine. And what Netanyahu's administration, his coalition administration, which is right wing and very far right wing uh, coalition, is they want to water down the powers of the Supreme Court. I think that's a fair way to summarise that. How how might that factor into what has happened in the last two weeks? And, 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 and let me just briefly expand on that, because sure. there, there are those who say that the Israelis knew damn well what was coming on the 7th and didn't intervene and took six hours to do anything because it might have suited the administration, um, you know, fighting this war with the Supreme Court, which wants to curtail um, Netanyahu. What do you make of that theory, Tony? Well, uh, oh, difficult, a bit of difficult question. I mean, I, I think the, um, is, the Israelis have, 
uh, actually wanted this. I mean, look at look. Okay, so the, on the judicial question of trying to alter the constitution of Israel to give the Supreme Court less power, there's one reason that's going on, and one reason only, and that's because Benjamin Netanyahu's got three cases against him right now of fraud, and he doesn't want to have to go to jail. Uh, as a result of any of that fraud. And so that's why he wants to change the Constitution. That's why there's been demonstrations uh, out in Tel Aviv uh, every Saturday this year so far. Uh, Many thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people uh, uh, coming out on the streets. Uh, The best best, uh, 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 slogan I've seen on a placard is a very simple one. It's crime minister, crime minister. I mean, that's what they're saying in Israel about the guy. Of course, they're also saying many of the Haaretz and other papers over there, including the Jerusalem Post, have been saying that uh, Netanyahu is leading the country into become a dictatorship. Now, those uh, reforms, I believe it was July they went through, finally. Uh, and, of course, there was massive demonstrations in July. But this is an attempt, it seems, to just distract away from all of that and say, well... And, I mean, in fact, by the way, the opinion polls in Israel are saying that something like 60, 70 percent of the population want to see Netanyahu gone now. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, there, there is uh, no there's no support really for his policies. And, and, and that's why there's also been so many people demonstrating out on the streets. But, yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, the guy's a crook. Uh, he's a dictator. He's spending more of his time trying to hold on to power because he knows that if he doesn't, that the judicial system will, will be sticking handcuffs on him and he'll be in prison for a very long time. Can we just talk about, if we leave exactly what's happening there and kind of flesh it out towards the rest of Europe, French listeners are getting in touch to ask your opinion on the reaction of governments in Europe. And we could even say the government here in the UK how no before you jump in no it's important hang on hang on no before you jump in hang on hang on because I haven't finished the question and then you can then you can take the floor then no they're asking look that our governments look like they might be seeking to take advantage of this as well by scaring up stories about how it increases the risk of terrorism here in Europe and how Jewish uh, UK citizens are not are, are not safe anymore. Is that happening in front of our eyes? That governments are taking advantage of it and saying, lovely, chance to take a bit more of your freedom and increase a bit more surveillance on what you're doing and what you're doing when you're online. What do you reckon? Well, that's exactly the sort of point I'm trying to make, is that this is why the Israelis want this. It's not just the Israelis that want this crisis, this kind of religious war. And by the way, it's also Muslims are very much more at danger. We've had a couple of Muslims around the world killed now, so-called as a result uh, of what's going on in uh, in um, Gaza and in Israel. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this puts more power in the hands of uh, the secret state. Uh, more powers in the hands of the securocrats. And, of course, that's a, a perfectly reasonable motive to make something like this happen. Uh, you know, I think that's that's per- that's perfectly sensible, perfectly reasonable. And, you know, it's a, a normal... I mean, we have to also look at Hamas, Richie. I'm sure you've done this. But Hamas is funded through the... Uh, Israel- from the American money that comes over to Israel, much of it makes its way through Qatar to Hamas. And, and I was amazed to see Haaretz retweeting... Well, I wasn't that amazed because they're pretty good, actually. Uh, the a report that they did uh, two years ago, which showed uh, Netanyahu in a cabinet. Uh, sorry, it wasn't a cabinet meeting. It was a Likud party meeting. Uh, and some of his Likud colleagues uh, were criticizing him, saying, why are we funding Hamas? And he had to defend it. He was saying this is the best way to undermine the Palestinians, you know, because if we're funding... No, hang on a minute, you're funding Hamas. He actually admitted it. So this idea we want to destroy Hamas, well, I mean, which one is it? Are you going to fund them uh, or are you going to exterminate them? And actually, of course, you're not actually exterminating them at all because they're all hiding in these tunnels, uh, the actual fighters. Uh, and what all you're doing is you're killing the civilians on the top. So you're not really achieving anything. Uh, you know, and I think the, this is the other thing is many, many people, of course, are being, you know, brought along as uh, around the world are looking at this and being very, very critical of Israel. So morally, they've completely lost. But I don't think they honestly care about that. They're, they're so unhinged that they really see only from their own point of view. They cannot see anyone else's point of view. It doesn't matter how many people they kill. Uh, they will still be right in their own eyes. Well, we've seen. It's something you and I discussed when I was doing this type of show in Spain. And we talked about it back then. 
you will remember the great Peter Oborn documentary on Channel 4 dispatches about the Israeli lobby. If anybody is under any illusion as to the extent or the success of the Israeli lobby in this country, they've only got to witness how MPs on both sides of that floor in the Commons, how they collapse in terror when they're asked to condemn what's going on in Gaza, when they're asked to declare their support for a ceasefire. I tell you what, Tony, there's no hiding it now, is there? Well, the, yeah, the Israel lobby is megally powerful. The Al Jazeera did a brilliant program on it too. It's good. Thanks for reminding me about the Peter Oborn one. Uh, yeah, it's in, enormously powerful, and what they do is, as an individual speaks out in defence of the Palestinians, as Jeremy Corbyn did, uh, you know, obviously there are other reasons why they might want to have got rid of Corbyn, but I mean that's that was a major part of why he was gotten rid of. Um, Julian Assange too was exposing a lot of crimes that the Israelis, the Americans, uh, and the collaboration, for example, between the ISIS fighters and uh, WikiLeaks was anyway between the ISIS fighters and um, uh, and the Americans and the Israelis uh, actually. You know, the, all all this sort of journalism that's being done, which exposes the hypocrisy. I mean, they, they were talking, weren't they, about, oh, this is ISIS, you know. Well, yeah, but you were helping ISIS. You had hospitals where you were, we're you, were um, yeah. you know, you were actually fixing up the ISIS fighters, making them better again, giving them a bit of rest and recuperation and sending them back to, to fight the Syrians. You know, everybody knows this, but it's almost as if this was supposed to never happen. So when you call... Uh, when you call Hamas ISIS, maybe just like you were helping uh, ISIS, you were helping Hamas too. So the idea is to create these two opposing forces, uh, get them to fight like crazy, uh, and potentially, you know, you've got a, th- a third world war here. You, I'm not kidding. You, what you've got is you've got Hamas um, doing their thing uh, in in Palestine. And you've then got the potential of uh, Hezbollah coming in from Lebanon, uh, it, and then you've also got uh, the the p- possible possible um, confrontation with the Syrian Syrian Arab army over the Golan Heights, the disputed Golan Heights, for example. They could just come charging and say, right, we're having the Golan Heights now after all this messing around. Uh, and then what would happen as soon as you get, you know, serious problems with the Israelis? And this is what I think is the nub of all this, really, Richie, which is that they don't care if they are really in a in a place with a time where they may not survive. You know, that, that maybe Tel Aviv is getting bombed. The government's been bombed. The army is on its last legs, etc. They don't care because they know that the Christian Zionists in the United States who believe that Israel is God's great gift to mankind and, and we have to support it at all costs. The Americans will come over to their aid. And I think this is in a way they're just it's almost like a masochistic form of self-harming where they know that, uh, they, that, they, that they, whatever happens, however bad it gets for the Israeli state, the Israeli defense force, etc. Uh, in fact, once it reaches a certain point, the Americans will come to their rescue. And maybe that's they're just waiting for, uh, you know, for the Americans to come charging in over the horizon and like they did in uh, the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago in 1973. The Americans came over, gave them loads of extra aid, brought soldiers over, etc., and saved the Israeli st- – well, they didn't quite save the Israeli state, so I don't think the entire state was threatened. But they really should just go back to the borders they were given in 1948. Uh, uh, that All the land, other land they've taken has been stolen uh, and is causing the problems we're seeing today. Yeah, nothing from Russia, interestingly enough. Not much anyway. Little from China. Um, the Iranians do what the Iranians do, which is saber-rattling, I think. I'm not, I'm not taking sides. I'm not criticizing them. But you get a bit of saber rattling, and um, you're right. You've got these ships in the Gulf, and you, you think, you know, it could all kick off any any moment now. We've only got a couple of minutes, right? So, the the the, the forces are massed on the on the edge of the prison. Let's not call it a border because it's a joke. It's a prison. So they're they're massed there. They have been for several days, and this invasion into Gaza hasn't quite happened yet. Why do you think it hasn't quite happened yet? And do you think it will happen? And if it does happen, how bad uh, will it be? Okay, a couple of reasons. I think maybe the whole thing is just uh, a scare tactic. Uh, they may not have any intention of going in there at all, knowing that if they, they kick off a war with Lebanon, that they will lose. Uh, um, because the Lebanese have said that they'll come charging in if they go into Gaza. So uh, there is there is that possibility. Uh, but we know we need to, I think, really need to 
I, I don't know is the answer. I mean, you know, they could be crazy, as I've said, enough to do something which would threaten the existence of... I mean, this is the, the irony of all of this. If you could allow to laugh at it, is that they're saying that the actions that the uh, Israeli far-right Israeli government are taking at the moment is actually quite possibly going to lead to the end of Israel. I mean, it could end, 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 end in them being obliterated. Uh, it's, it's only a tiny little, small little state... And uh, they're surrounded by uh, very angry right now Arab neighbours, many of whom have uh, quite a fragile control from the United States. But quite obviously what is happening is there's an attempt to start this. And, I, I, you know, we hear about, uh, I mean, the, the, the term Jews, let's just forget that, because the Zion, Zionists is what this is about, the idea of creating an Israeli state. And I'm actually not an anti-Zionist. I just think that the people who ha who are, have have um, put themselves in charge in Israel are maniacs. You know, the idea is I think we need to have, like we do it in Britain and in many other countries, we need to have a proper opposition. And if they had a proper opposition, it wasn't all controlled, their politics and their so-called sham democracy, uh, that, that you could have a brilliant, a beautiful state in Israel where everyone is living in harmony. So I've no problem with Jews going back. What I do have a problem with is the you know is this far right people who've taken over they're sort of squatting the word Jew and uh, tr using it for the most evil purposes possible known to man so these the, the religious side of it's so important which is where we get back to go back to 1871 and this Albert Pike letter um, which was written to Giuseppe Mazzini Albert Pike was the Grand Master of, uh, of, of the Scottish Rite Freemasons in the United States. He was also a Confederate Army officer. And I mean, if you if you look into who the Scottish Rite are, they're you know they're they're the most uh, should we I don't know how, what's the right word occultic, uh, satanic. Uh, you know, th this is it's Little Rock, Arkansas, is where you find the Albert Pike statue. And it's also Little Rock, Arkansas, is where we saw the Baphomet statue rolled out uh, a couple of years ago, where they said, oh, we, if you're going to have a picture of Jesus Christ in the um, uh, Capitol building, we're also, we're, you know, and they've, they're legally fighting for this. We also want a statue of Baphomet, you know, uh, which As is this, yeah, this, ta uh, this Templar thing. So anyway, uh, the point being that the... Uh, the third world war he wanted to create the, his his letter talks about three world wars the first world war was to destroy the ottomans and the british let the british take over the holy land then the second world war to allow for the creation of this crusader state uh, and the third world war was going to be that what he calls the nihilists who are these maniacal uh, far right racist uh, islamophobic nutter zionists uh, to have a war with the islamic world and the idea is to create such a hatred of religion, you know, to get the whole world to hate the Abrahamic faith, to try and blame them. And we saw a sort of similar thing in Northern Ireland. I keep coming back to this, where we had the Protestants versus the Catholics. And it wasn't really anything to do with the Protestant faith versus the Catholic faith. It was the, the Protestant establishment, the Paisleys, etc., versus the largely secular IRA and uh, Sinn Féin, you know. So it is, there's a real attempt to frame these things as religious conflicts with the idea, ultimately, to, to get everybody... Um, I suppose to, I mean, what the, what the, the letter actually says is to bring in a kind of new world Luciferian religion as a result of everyone getting so annoyed with these faiths, the whole thing being spun as a, a war between the faiths. So I think this Albert Pike letter is definitely worth looking at. It's not 100% certain as to whether it's authentic, uh, but there is a lot of articles, there's a lot of time and effort gone into the articles out there online, you'll find, to try and make uh, people think, oh, it's all a fake letter. Of course, it's very difficult to prove that it's a fake. And also, a lot of them are just wrong, because they talk about uh, William Guy Carr's book, Pawns in the Game, being the only place where this is written about. It isn't. There's several other authors that wrote about it, and I've dug out some of this information myself, just to, to, to show that it isn't just him, and that these articles are actually wrong, that there was this letter in the uh, British Library, uh, up until something like the 1970s, and it's now just disappeared, vanished. But it's a fascinating letter to read, and it seems to uh, it seems to uh, exactly reflect what we're seeing today. It's an attempt to create a religious war.
Tony will pick it up next time this week dot org dot uk because I'm fascinated by that. And uh, Fridays at five o'clock in Bristol, not the BCFM politics show. Great stuff, pal. Thanks for coming on today and sharing that. Can I just that. plug my book briefly? As quick as you can. Go ahead. Okay. So it's called The Traitors of Arnhem. <coughs> it's, on, it's up there on eBay. And it shows, that it proves beyond any shadow of a doubt, uh, the links between the Nazis and Winston Churchill in 1944 and his private secretary, Martin Borman, Hitler's private secretary, and Churchill's private secretary, Desmond Morton. And the, the Nazi loot at the end of the war, all the money they'd taken, looting the whole of Europe, came to London. And uh, I won't spoil the story, but it's a, an interesting tale, and it's all connected up with Operation Market Garden and the origins of the Bilderberg conferences. It's, ex- it's excellent. I've got it here. eBay is the traders of Arnhem. Tony Gosling. Tony, thanks, pal. Speak again next time. Tony Gosling, live Fridays from Bristol, 5 p.m. It's an excellent program weekly. Uh, go to thisweek.org.uk. Thanks so much to Tony. The time is exactly one minute past six. It's Wednesday's program. You're with the Richie Allen Show.